Welcome to the FOMO Show about TV technologies and home theater news. Today's headlines spotlight LG, Samsung, and for next year, more QD OLED sizes. But speaking of sizes, let's talk about Hisense. Cheaper 100-inch TVs? Samsung is not happy about it. What do I mean? Let's start with what you guys have already known. Last month, Hisense announced 100-inch TV, the U8K. Now, we all like the U8K at the 65, 75, 85-inch size. But when they announced 100 inches, I was pretty excited. Well, what I wasn't happy about was the price, $10,000. But surprise, surprise, when it did release this week, what is the price? $49.99, literally half the price that was announced and way cheaper than TCL. Now, you're asking me, wait, has anyone bought this? Yes, they have, and it's already sold out. And today's video is brought to you by WhoKeys. Trying to build a PC on a budget, but don't know where to buy your Windows 10 software on the cheap? WhoKeys to the rescue. Use my code SF20 and immediate discount. At the bottom of this order where it says code card, to the right is the product key you need to activate Windows. So copy this long number, then go to the Windows menu and click on settings. In the settings menu at the bottom, select update and security. Select activation, then select change product key, paste what you copied from WhoKeys, click next, click activate, and you're done. You can download a copy of Windows 11 Pro with my discount code SF20 and BAM. People know a good deal when they see it. For example, one of our own, Jason M. Seable, he already bought it. He set it up on Saturday, glorious 100 inch. So clearly people have this TV and they love it. Now, my response to this is TCL. What's up with this price? $8,999? Well, actually when you click on it, what happens is if you happen to be a Best Buy member, $74.76, still a bit expensive. My expectation is this. Once TCL sees that the Hisense $49.99 price selling off the shelves with very similar image quality, they're both mini LED TVs, TCL's gotta match it, if not beat it. And when I say beat it, I'm hoping $4,500. Now I know that's a bit aggressive, but definitely under $5,000 for the Hisense U8K 100 inch, two inches larger, so I think the Kiro Mate needs to be at least 47.50 at 98 inches to compete, but ultimately, this is the future. Now, this is the U8K. Predictions, what if the U7K released a 100-inch TV? Maybe next year, right? That second tier. That could be the sweet spot. I like the U7K. It's a pretty good TV, but at 100 inches and maybe $3,800 to say $1,000 cheaper, can get pretty compelling. And I think this is where things are going. For consumers who have $3,500 to $4,000 to spend, now they're asking me, wait, wait, FOMO, you love the Sony A95L, 77 inch, close to 5,000, but for a similar amount, I can get a 100 inch. Well, let me tell you, surprise, surprise. For those who are coming from an LCD TV, I'm telling them to get the 100 inch TV. Seriously, now think about it, okay? They're both similar price, right? You have up to $5,000 to spend. The 77 inch A95L, phenomenal. But if you're coming from an LCD TV, the U8K is going to be a huge improvement already in image quality. HDR impact, not only that, the 100 inch size, that immersion blows away the additional image quality improvements of a 77 inch OLED. Now, many of you may argue, but I'm telling you right now, if you're gonna sit eight or nine feet away from a 100 inch TV, man, that's, I'm still gonna have to go with a 100 inch mini LED LCD TV. But tell me, what do you guys think? Would you go for the same price with a 77 inch A95L King of TVs Sony QD OLED or an additional 23 inches of immersion? That's something to think about. And this is one way that the Chinese companies can compete with the best from Korea. Speaking of the best from Korea, so Samsung is not happy with this, nor is LG. And when I say not happy with this, specifically, Samsung and LG accelerate countermeasures against China to reconfigure the supply chain. And so it's a broader, a broader sense of resentment <laughs> against TCL and Hisense. And specifically in this article, it actually calls out Hisense and TCL as a threat 
to the Korean companies, Samsung and LG, because they are taking market share from the Korean companies. We're talking taking market share from Samsung Electronics and LG Electronics, right? So Samsung sells what? LCD TVs that they call QLED, and they source these LCD panels from China, specifically BOE and TCL. And Hisense is also sourcing from those same suppliers. And ultimately, Samsung's like, wait a minute, if we want to compete, we have to stop putting money into the hands of our competitors. Because even though TCL supplies Samsung with the panels to make LCD TVs, specifically some of their QLED TVs, the Q95C or the 90C and so forth, and they're thinking, we'd rather put those resources outside of China, like Taiwan, AUO, and hopefully this doesn't give China too much of an influence over the global TV market because it gets back to what we just talked about. Think about this. The Korean companies, Samsung and LG, they're under the impression that at the $4,000 price point, the $3,000, even the $5,000, Chinese companies have no chance, right? They don't have OLED technology. They cannot do it very well. And even if they did, it'd still be too expensive. It'd be maybe a few hundred dollars cheaper at best, but it wouldn't be way cheaper. So the Chinese response, and I love this response because selection for everyone, they will go after that same price point, but with large LCD TVs that are good enough. I'm talking about the QM8, the U7K, the Q7, and the U8K 100 inch. If all of these TVs are under $5,000, what they'll say to consumers like ourselves is this, look, OLED, the best of the best, that's fine. But if you need large, I mean, if you want that immersion and your room is bright, it's not the perfect place to watch, and you're just streaming and watching sports, how about a 100 inch TV experience? That's pretty compelling. I mean, <laughs> I might have second thoughts about getting an OLED if I'm putting it into a mixed entertainment room. What are your thoughts on that? Should Samsung and LG feel threatened? I think they should, which means next year, expect a whole lot more 100-inch size TVs. And speaking of LG troubles, next-gen tuners, right? The ATSC 3.0, it looks like in 2024, no LG TVs will have this ATSC 3.0 tuner in the TV because there's a patent dispute. Specifically, LG did not or is not paying the right patent holders to have access to the technology to use an ATSC 3.0 tuner or next-gen TV. All those of you who do have an LG TV currently or in the past with the ATSC 3.0 tuner, it still works. The problem is for new buyers moving forward in 2024, it's not going to be in the TVs. And I know many of you ask, wait, can't they just include it? And then when they settle this whole patent dispute, activate it? I don't think so. Now, those of you who are patent attorneys, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I suspect that LG is going to play it safe and not include it at all because any additional violations will just result in a fine. So what they're going to do is just leave it off for 2024, hopefully settle it out. But I don't think this is the point though. The reason I bring up this article is less about the tuner and more about us as consumers. How many of you are actually using the ATSC 3.0 tuners in your TVs or an external tuner? And if you are, has your image quality improved? Like what is better about it? My understanding is there's no 4K HDR content on ATSC 3.0 from any station in the USA, anywhere. Now the stations that do have 3.0, all they're doing is the same old content, nothing special, no HDR, no high frame rate sports. So at this point, I don't think it's a big issue for those of you who are concerned about this, because if your stations are not broadcasting in HDR and or high frequency frame rates, ATSC 3.0 is a little bit pointless, and we're still a few years off. And why is that? Mostly because all these broadcast stations, for them to upgrade their equipment to get it to 4K HDR, way too expensive, or to get it to high frame rates, way too expensive, and speaking of better TVs, this article from Flat Panels HD, finally, Nobel Prizes have been awarded in chemistry for the inventors of Quantum Dot. QD OLED, QLED, the Q was finally recognized as a game changer in many ways. Now, we benefit from the TV panels, TV technologies, but apparently it can be used in many things. But what is kind of sad is that it took 40 years for these three people to be recognized, specifically in the early 80s. One of them discovered quantum dots. 
Then mid 80s, someone else built on top of that. And then by the early 90s, the third person developed it even further. So from the early 80s to the early 90s, they pretty much put quantum dots on the map, but it took a lot of actual implementation to where they win the Nobel Peace Prize in 2023. Kudos to them. But for me, what is very interesting is this bottom part right here. The future of quantum dots. So QD OLED in the last two years, huge game changer, right? The minute Samsung Display released it, and then Sony put out the A95L, and last year, Samsung with the S95B, impactful. But the question is, the future of quantum dots, what is it? What is the next generation implementation and how far away is it? Well, my friends, first, Nanosys, the company that provides the quantum dot for TV panel makers like Samsung Display, was acquired. And this is why it's important. The acquiring company, Shea Chemical of Japan, they announced that they want to develop ELQD displays. EL stands for electroluminescent. This is self-emissive emissive QDs, meaning they will replace the OLED subpixel with actual quantum dot self-emissive subpixel with no backlight. Like right now, the QD OLED QD is only a color converting layer. The OLED behind it is blue, and the blue is generating the energy, hitting the quantum dots, converting it into colors, right? But with ELQD, there is no blue in the backlight. Each EL quantum dot is itself self-emissive. Let's just look real quick at where we are today. This is from Nanosys' website. And if you look at this, right, XQDEF, this is the QLED technology. LCD TVs that use quantum dot, they apply this XQDEF. It is to make the backlight more pure in terms of white, but they're still using the LCD layer and they're using polarizers and color filters and all that. The quantum dot doesn't provide the actual color converting or the color filter purpose. What it does, is it gives you that pure white backlight to expand the colors, make the colors a bit more pure, so to speak. And so QLED-like TVs, like the U8K, the Q95C, the Samsung Q80C, their colors look more vibrant because of this quantum dot in the backlight. But what we see today is this QD OLED, where you have that layer of blue I talked about. This blue layer generates the light energy so that you have the red and green quantum dot color converting layer, converting it to its colors. And then the blue is a pass through from the blue OLED to generate its blue, right? So there's no QD that's blue. It is a red and green QD with an OLED pass through. And this is kind of like the scatter plate for the blue. And this is the reason why a lot of people complain, hey, in a bright room with light shining directly on the QD OLED TV, like the Samsung S90C or last year's S95B, there appears to be a lifted gray, right? It, it doesn't feel perfectly black in a bright room. It's because the scatter plate absorbs some of that light. And so the solution is this generation of QD micro LED. They are replacing that blue with a micro LED blue. So you don't have this scatter plate. You have straight up blue micro LED. And of course, here's the special part. Remember QNED, the way Samsung described it, not LG's QNED, right? That was LG hijacking Samsung's original nickname for this. Quantum dot nanorod LED, QNED. That was the original abbreviation. That's what it meant, right? Quantum dot nanorod LEDs. And that nanorod was supposed to be blue. And so that's the micro LED, right? They're replacing organic, the OLED blue, with this nanorod micro LED blue. However, because of the success of QD OLED, Samsung Display shelved this project. So this project is still there. Once we've exhausted the performance of QD OLED using organic OLED blue layer, we can then use the micro LED blue, which would eliminate any of the shortcomings of organic OLED or organic, the organic blue layer. And that includes burn in or the scatter plate issue where it slightly lifts the black. This is definitely the next generation. How far away is it? Really depends on how successful QD OLED is. If consumers love QD OLED and they don't need anything more, we may never see QD micro LED. Now, what we were talking about earlier with a Japanese company accelerating the development of ELQD or electroluminescent QD, now nicknamed nano LED. So nano LED, each of these pixels 
are a self-emitting QD quantum dot pixel that emits its own energy without any additional energy behind it. And I saw this prototype at Display Week this year. They have the red and the green. They do not have the blue. So the prototype was mostly red, orange, brown images. I said, where's your blue? And he's like, yeah, this is not ready for a TV yet. Currently, quantum dot electroluminescent technology, when it comes to blue, simply is too unstable. So we're definitely at least five years away from getting a blue that will have the same lifetime as a QD OLED. And of course, Netflix is always in the news. Now they're raising prices, but that's not the news to me. Of course, they'll be raising prices. The question is, why? Now, part of the reason many people are arguing, oh, it's because it costs more to get light rights and licenses from the movie production companies like Warner Brothers and Columbia Pictures and so forth, right? That's only part of the story, I think. Here's the other part. And you tell me if I'm off base here. So they're raising prices $3 in the premium tier. Now, what makes the premium tier special, right? So right here, Netflix Premium is required for you to stream in 4K, HDR10, and Dolby Vision, and Dolby Atmos. It's the last two that gave me pause. I go, wait a minute. Wait, Dolby Vision? That's not free. It costs money. 4K and HDR10, open. There's no license fee to be paid. 4K, great, free. HDR10, another open license standard, free. But Dolby Vision is not free and Dolby Atmos is not free. So the question is this. Now, you guys saw my earlier video about the fall of the House of Usher, where the differences between HDR10 and Dolby Vision were not significant. If anything, they were just different. And at worst, on the Sony A95L, the Dolby Vision Dark was a bit lifted, but for sure, HDR10 did not fall behind. At worst, slightly different, slightly. And with that, even SDR looked pretty good. So my question is, for you guys, I know it's only $3 a month, but if much of that goes to pay for the Dolby Vision license to keep this Dolby Vision thing going, on the other hand, Dolby Atmos, though, may be a different benefit. I don't think Dolby Vision is a huge benefit at all because you have HDR10 as an alternative. Dolby Atmos, there's not many alternatives. And But let me ask you this. Dolby Atmos is great if you have the full discrete experience, like I do, right? I have an amazing discrete experience with a trim-off processor and 11 speakers around me and four speakers overhead. But most people, <laughs> they don't even have a sound bar. Don't believe me? Check out this video. So if you guys haven't caught them already, the boys at the Daily Hi-Fi podcast, right? Joe and Tell and Chana, Techno Dad. So I've talked to the guy at Netflix and their data shows that most people that are watching Netflix are watching on TV speakers. It, not even sound bars. Not even a sound bar. <laughs> not even a sound bar. <laughs> I love those guys. So it takes us back to this question. Dolby Atmos. At least it works well. I know in Fall of the House of Usher, Atmos really is amazing. It's truly surround. And of course, you have to invest in the right system to feel it. So I think on the upside, Dolby Atmos is there, right? So worst case, you have a TV, but one day, if you ever upgrade to a full surround with ceiling speakers, you'll benefit from Atmos. Even in a 5.1 with sound bars, Atmos doesn't make a difference. So my recommendation is if you're looking at surround and you want to truly experience Atmos, you have to get discrete ceiling speakers installed in the ceiling. Otherwise, you're not really getting the Atmos effect. I mean, it's surround, but that's not Atmos, right? The Atmos is really the ceiling part. But if most of you are watching TV speakers, what's the point? But at least the upside is very high. But again, how much are you paying for Dolby Vision in this monthly fee? And I think we're paying more than we think, and this is why. As Netflix releases more and more original content in Dolby Vision, that's an additional license fee. That's a variable cost. That's going up with more and more content made available to streamers. So they're going to have to raise the prices, don't they? The more content they have, that's Dolby Vision. The more they're going to have to charge. The question is how much more? 50 cents? A dollar? Let me know. Is Dolby Vision important to you guys when you're watching Netflix, right? Speaking of Netflix, instead of Dolby Vision, how about this? New York City mayor casually announces he's deep faking himself. Experts are horrified. And so in this article on Vice, right, how does he deep fake himself? Basically, he's taking his voice. He's using AI to convert that voice into 
Mandarin, French, Spanish, all the native languages of New York City. He's using the AI to make all these translations, these interpretations, sound like his voice, right? So let's say you have a Chinese person speaking Mandarin, the translation, AI will take that person's voice and make it sound just like the mayor. And I thought, oh, that's genius. Think about it. Netflix can take this AI, right? So let's say a Korean actor, you know, you watch a lot of Korean drama or Mandarin drama speaking their native language. AI can be used to convert that language into English and sound just like the original. And then you use AI to change the lips, which they are already doing. Suddenly, it looks like it's a native speaker. The actor, like, I don't know, Chris Hemsworth speaking in Mandarin fluently. And then I thought, oh, wait, did I just open a Pandora's box? But the actor's strike just coming to a conclusion. Does this open it up to renegotiation? Like, who's getting paid? Does the actor still get paid? Because it is his image and likeness, that voice. So sticking with Netflix, Netflix plans to release AAA games, maybe even Grand Theft Auto. So we already know about these cloud gaming initiatives by all these large companies. And the biggest fail, of course, was Google's own Stadia. But it appears that Netflix maybe didn't learn from that because look at how they plan to implement it. So of course, AAA games are great, but the question is always about latency. And they're thinking, what a bright idea. Let's use your phone's app to control as a controller for cloud gaming. And I thought, this, not a good look, guys, because the latency between your controller and the TV and the cloud, doesn't this add an additional layer of latency? Now, I know it's beta testing, but I have my doubts that this is going to work. But then again, Maybe you guys don't care. Maybe you want the convenience of AAA gaming on Netflix, but I really don't like this interface where you're using your phone's app as the controller. I just, good things cannot happen with that. Speaking of games, so you guys saw my video last week. I was talking about how HDR10 Plus changes the game because it's actually dynamic tone mapping and it shifts the burden of tone mapping each scene scene by scene or frame by frame onto the GPU. Well, Dolby Vision Gaming finally has announced they're doing the same thing. Or are they? Because my complaint about Dolby Vision Gaming is I do not believe, and I'm pretty certain on Xbox Series X games, it's not dynamic tone mapping. There is no way your TV can handle 120 frames per second with each frame being dynamically tone mapped. More likely than not, it's a Dolby Vision Gaming filter and it's not working out very well because ultimately it's just a static filter. Might as well just use HDR or HGIG if you're going to use static metadata. So Adobe Vision is announcing, no, 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 we're going to do this amazing native plugin. So when I heard native, similar to HDR 10 plus gaming, so now they both have a native plugin, right? Adobe Vision in Unreal Engine, HDR 10 plus also in Unreal Engine. But Unlike HDR10+, Plus, which has not announced compatibility with Xbox Series X, Dolby Vision has. I'm thought, how is this possible? Because I know that the Xbox is not capable, the GPU is not as capable as a dedicated discrete GPU on an NVIDIA graphics board, which is what you need for HDR10 Plus gaming, HDR tone mapping, right? So digging a little bit deeper, I discovered this on the Unreal website. And, you know, Dolby Vision, and I was looking at the specs, and I was pretty excited because confirmation right here, frame by frame tone mapping. So, okay, finally, here with this native launch of the Unreal plugin for developers, it's matched HDR10 Plus gaming. But what about Xbox Series X? Well, the fine print over here, it does require a dedicated GPU, like we know it would on most gaming PCs. So first, not all gaming PCs, but most importantly, PCs. It's a PC rig that will benefit from this very efficient 0.2 milliseconds of low latency. It left out Xbox. And hey, if you don't think I'm on the right track, you can call me out later when it's released. But I suspect that Dolby Vision Gaming 
tone mapping frame by frame like HDR10 Plus is also limited to PCs and specific graphics cards. We'll find out what it is once this launches. And I suspect that Xbox Series X, Dolby Vision Gaming will remain unchanged. It will probably still be using static metadata because the TV simply cannot process that quickly. Now, 4K30, maybe, right? 4K60, maybe, but 4K120, no way. Now, QD OLED sizes. Check it out. It's official. Dell has announced QD OLED monitors for 2024, releasing in January at CES. So the 32-inch 4K resolution, and this is what disappoints me, though. Ah, it is curved. I was hoping for a flat one, but at least if you want flat, the 27-inch QD OLED is flat, but then it's got the 360 hertz refresh, and I'm thinking... I don't need 360 hertz. I'm getting this as a productivity monitor, but there is an alternative, which is the Asus 32-inch QD OLED. And guess what? Yes, it is flat. So I'll probably get the Asus, even though I won't need the 240 hertz. Flat is key, but more importantly, for those like me who use it for productivity as a monitor, this time they're tweaking the subpixel for text clarity. So the current setup, the the way the pixels are set up in a triangle formation, the complaint is that there is some of that chromatic aberration where text isn't too clear. This slightly tweaked subpixel structure should make text clear, but we'll see. But yeah, I'll probably get it next year to replace one of my 32 inch monitors because well, why not, right? I'm actually using it for work. Now, before we head off, I wanna show you something special, a teaser for the next video. I have here Sony's first Bluetooth bong. Well, it looks like a Bluetooth bong. We'll find out. Review coming up. <laughs> Until next time, stop the FOMO.